During the time that Zhu Enlai was on the road, the Soviet Union set up a treaty drafting committee. From January 5 to 20, 13 documents were prepared, some of which were changed several times. By the time Zhu Enlai arrived, the Soviet Union had all the documents ready. But the Chinese Communist Party had never engaged in diplomacy, it did not know what was meant by a treaty and what was meant by an agreement, it was not clear. There is a very problematic passage in Chinese history books, it says that this Sino-Soviet alliance treaty was drafted by the Chinese side, and the Soviet Union did not change it much and agreed to it from. This is complete nonsense. This is what the diplomatic history of the People's Republic of China compiled by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs says, and then the biography of Mao Zedong compiled by the Central Bureau of Documents says the same thing. What do they base it on? I wrote an article in 1997, because I had seen all these documents coming and going in 1997, and on January 6, the Soviet Union drafted the first draft of the treaty, and it was submitted to Stalin on the 20th and seven drafts were changed before and after, and Zhu Enlai was still on the train at that time. But I don't know why they published the book afterwards. I checked, they have a basis, it is said that on January 25, Mao Zedong sent a telegram to Liu Shaoqi. The original of that telegram said this, the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Friendship and Alliance was drafted by us, and the Soviet Union adopted it without changes. There are two possibilities here. First, Mao Zedong was talking nonsense. Second, he was talking about the second half of the matter. The process was like this, after the Soviet Union drafted it, it was given to China on the 23rd, China changed two things, first, the second and third paragraphs were combined, that is, the carriage return was removed and linked. Second, the original word was, all, but he changed the word and added, right, to, ownership. On the 24th, Zhu Enlai met with Mai Koyan, and there was a paragraph specifically about this treaty. My coin said, since you have not made any substantive changes, is this the way the treaty is going to be? Zhu Enlai said, yes, let's do that. This is what actually happened. Of course you say that China later changed these two places, the Soviet Union did not change again, so it was passed, it is also understandable. Maybe Mao meant this latter, but this used an eyewash. To make people think that the treaty was drafted by China. Why is that? I'm puzzled. I raised this issue in 1997, hoping that the foreign ministry and the central archives would produce evidence that this treaty was drafted by China. What evidence? The text. You say China drafted it, you show the text, it must be in Chinese, it must be in the archives. I believe that there is no such document, I saw the original Russian, how the Chinese side changed, how the all the documents back and forth are now declassified, and I have them all here, so I dare to say this. In fact, we should go deeper and ask why Mao Zedong had to tell this lie. Not only he, but also Zhu Enlai later had a telegram, also said the same thing. Because at that time when Mao went to Moscow, the pressure was very high. When the Communist Party first seized power, except for the upper echelons of the party, which were friendly to the Soviet Union. The common people, especially the intellectual class, basically held a negative attitude toward the Soviet Union. The United States was considered white imperialism and the Soviet Union was red imperialism, none of which was good. It turned out that they occupied the Northeast, and the repercussions of the Soviet army's bad behavior were particularly great. Before Mao Zedong went there, a special political consultation meeting was held. Because that time just took power when still more respect for these social sages and democratic parties, so call to listen to the views. They all said you cannot go. Why? You see, these Chinese emperors do not have their own dynasties, they go out, it is always people come to pay tribute are. You go out more degrading, and you cannot get a what, come back to look bad. But Mao Zedong cannot not go, that is Stalin are. Do you want Stalin to come to Beijing to see you? It must be he who goes. When Stalin died, Khrushchev should come to pay homage to him. So he was under great pressure, and he was very worried that the failure to negotiate this new treaty would have a great impact on the Communist Party, especially his reputation and his position. So later there were several telegrams in which Mao Zedong emphasized that the matter of the Sino-Soviet alliance treaty should be kept, strictly confidential, just talk about it on a small scale and not to spread it outside and several telegrams talked about this matter. 
what the Soviets drafted basically retained the contents of the 1945 treaty, except that the port of Lushuan was returned to China after the signing of the contract with Japan. What the Chinese Communist Party changed the most was actually the latter agreement, the substantive stuff. This is basically a reworking of the Chinese. The Chinese demand was that the port of Lushuan be returned to China after the signing of the contract with Japan or in 1952. This draft was given to the Soviet side on the 26th. I read four texts, one of which was changed the most, all forks. But two days later, on the 28th, the Soviet Union finally returned a text similar to the one drafted by China, which postponed the immediate return of the Eastern China Railway, until after the signing of the contract with Japan or until 1952. Basically, it agreed with the Chinese side. Now there is a missing document, that is, how the discussion within the Soviet Union took place from the 26th to the 28th, which is not very clear. I have not found the documents in this regard, but the results are relatively clear, there is another episode here, is the issue of Mongolia. On the 28th, Zhu Enlai went to Stalin and said, Comrade Stalin, I want to talk to you about a problem. Stalin said, what do you want to talk about? He said I want to talk about the Mongolian question. You see the record of Shazir, who was the interpreter at that time, said, Stalin's face went white when he heard it. Didn't you guys not mention the Mongolian question? Why do you still mention the Mongolian question? Zhu Enlai said, we are ready to declare recognition of the independence of Outer Mongolia, you see the declaration we drafted. Stalin took a look and understood. He knew what Zhu Enlai was trying to do. Zhu Enlai's declaration was written in such a way that he said, what about the Sino-Soviet Friendship Treaty, now that the two sides have agreed on it, two annexes will serve as a way for him to declare the recognition of the independence of Outer Mongolia. One annex declares that because Outer Mongolia has passed a referendum in January 1946, we recognize this reality. The second point is the agreement drafted by the Chinese side on the port of Lushuan, the port of Dalian, and the Central and Long Road, which is also an annex to the treaty. If you agree to our terms, we will recognize the independence of Outer Mongolia, but if you don't, then we can't issue the declaration. I think this was one of the reasons why Stalin agreed to the Chinese conditions. In short, on the 28th, remember this date, January 28th, the Soviet Union agreed to the Chinese terms. Because what happened two days later had to do with the Korean War, which we will talk about tomorrow. Why did Stalin make such concessions again and again? This is a completely different understanding from the past. In the past, it was thought that China had suffered and Mao had been aggrieved, but in fact he said so himself. He always gave people a speech saying so, giving people an impression. In fact, he only 30 before that week no one cared about him. Later two major concessions were made by Stalin, why? Because from the point of view of the whole international situation at that time, as far as diplomacy is concerned, Stalin had only one card in his hand. He had to form an alliance with the Chinese Communist Party in order to ensure the security of his Eastern Front. Mao Zedong, on the other hand, had three cards in his hand objectively speaking, he could have allied with the Soviet Union, he could have allied with the United States, and he had the objective circumstances to take the middle road. But subjectively Mao had no choice, but as far as outsiders were concerned, he actually had three cards in his hand, so Stalin was bound to make concessions. 